Hey everyone, welcome to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. I'm Tracy Friedlander, and today on the show, I have percussionist Chris Salvito and pianist Nicoletta Favari of Passepartout Duo. These two have created a very cool career, founding their own new music ensemble, where they combine their love for travel with their passion for new music. I was initially intrigued by the music videos on their Facebook page, and when I looked more closely, I saw they are also world travelers. I wanted to get the lowdown on how they make this all possible. They have created a life where they get to explore and expand their creativity and artistry, and at the same time, they explore the world. The way they do this logistically is extremely unique, and more musicians have to hear that this is an option for anyone in their career. I'm excited for you to hear all about it right now. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Fix Music for sponsoring Crushing Classical Podcast. Fixmusic.com is your online resource for high quality and affordable sheet music. There are some new offerings at Fix available that you'll want to know about. Now, there's organ music, lots and lots of choral music, as well as orchestral parts that you may need for concerts or auditions. And guess what? They are also actively working with choral and orchestra directors to help them plan their seasons. So if you're a program director and you want some help on choosing pieces for your season you may not have thought of already, contact Fix Music today through their website. And as always, free shipping on all domestic orders. Check out fixmusic.com for your sheet music needs and use the link in the show notes to receive 10% off your first order. Let's get started. Hey, Chris. Hey, Nicoletta. Welcome to the show. Thanks for, Thanks. Having, us. Thanks for having us. So yeah. glad to have you on here. So Chris and Nicoletta are a couple and a musical duo called Passepartout Duo, which performs, you perform new music compositions and commissions all around the world. So that when I, when I discovered what you do and I saw some of your photography, I was just like, who are, are these people and what are they, how are they creating this incredible career where they get to be world travelers. So I immediately contacted you guys and I was so happy that you wrote back right away. So um, so tell me a little bit about what you guys do. <laughs> okay, so Passepartout Duo in many ways is a regular new music group. We uh, play new music, uh, which means uh, compositions other people write for us that are commissioned or recent works that are for instrumentation or sometimes our own compositions. And another aspect um, of our group that uh, made music videos of these works that's really important to us. And also sometimes it can coincide with collaborations with other people, dancers, animators, um, anybody who wants to collaborate with us really. But the thing I think that makes us unique is that we do all of that while continually traveling. We don't have a home base that we go back to. Um, and it's something that's uh, really fueled our creative practice. It's been an inspiration for us. And the main uh, platform that uh, we use to make that possible is something called Artist Residencies, okay. a special kind of institution that uh, gives time and space to artists. They come in all shapes and sizes, and you usually apply to have some of this time and space. And when you hear back, you get to go somewhere new uh, for maybe a month, maybe two months, maybe two weeks, who knows. Uh, and yeah, we've kind of linked those together alongside touring activities and performing and all the regular things that you'd expect to do as a new music ensemble. Uh, and that's given us a chance to travel. Yeah. So great. So great. So there's a lot there to unravel. So I'm excited to getting into this um, conversation. And so, so you, so Nicoletta, you're a pianist, right? Yeah. yeah. And Chris is a percussionist. So how did you, how did you first meet and start playing together? Yeah, so it was uh, July 2015 when we both uh, were selected as members of a, a contemporary music ensemble in the context of the Atlantic Music Festival Festival in May. And there we worked together um, for around four weeks uh, um, rehearsing. Did and, you audition uh, for that um, festival? Or? Yeah. Okay. An application and yeah, we sent in a mm -hmm. tape. Yeah. Individually. And Individually, yeah, yeah. Okay. we hadn't met before. So okay, we were like five or six people, and it was quite unique because the feeling of the playing together with those people in particular was really good. It was just a great experience to work okay. uh, all together in that group. And uh, so by the end, after like around forty pieces we played together, uh, we felt like, oh, there's something good here, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, we wanted to have 
uh, uh, more chamber music experiences and more uh, everlasting, let's say. So we thought we could uh, apply together uh, for some uh, future uh, projects. So we applied to a uh, residency for the winter musicians at the BAM Center in Canada. Okay. And uh, by the time we uh, applied and heard back from it, we had a name for an ensemble and uh, we had plans for our first European tours, uh, tour with uh, five or six concerts. And uh, we had uh, the first titles down for works that existed uh, for a repertoire. For oh, great. So you dove right in. You were like, this is yeah, happening, people. <laughs> So how did you yeah, pick? Yeah, because soon uh, uh, after the festival, I had to go back to Scotland where I was living. Okay. And so at first, uh, there was also this big problem ha having an ensemble between a split between two continents. Yeah. And there was no time to waste, let's say. Exactly. How did you come up with the name Passepartout? Um, well, we had a few options, and uh, we really liked the fact uh, that... It could be um, meant in different ways by different people, um, but the main uh, meaning that we really like is the fact that uh, Passepartout means goes everywhere, anywhere. So there's also, uh, uh, colloquially, it's meant like a master key that opens every door. And okay. uh, we like this idea of, uh, of being able to, uh, having plenty of possibilities. Yeah, yeah. You know, I Googled it and it came up that it was like part of a frame as is, well yeah which is a cool concept as well so i like that that's neat yeah <laughs> i love it i love it so um so tell me about your um your original paths because not everybody sets out and says i'm going to i'm going to go into new music originally when you first started as a pianist as a percussionist were you um were you thinking along the lines of going into a, a, you know, the normal way of going about it, like, I'll be a chamber musician or in an orchestra, maybe, Chris, you, you thought that, or as a pianist, you could be a accompanist or a soloist or even in an orchestra. Like, were these things options for you at first, or were you always not interested in the, in the traditional way of doing it? Well, for percussionists, I think it's a bit in our... DNA, our collective DNA, to be um, enticed by unconventional uh, career paths mm -hmm. and as well new music. And this is mainly just because in terms of, okay, I'm studying at a music school in the United States. If you're in that situation, then the repertoire for your instrument is not, uh, it's pretty recent. Like maybe it starts at people like John Cage or something. Right. Uh, and so... I think the instrument just lends itself to this. So it's really natural for a percussionist to seek out opportunities in new music. Um, I think it actually takes a really, really unique and special kind of percussionist to want to be an orchestral player. It's a very specific thing uh, to want to be that guy in the back that plays the triangle. I mean, it's a really, it's a really specific thing. Um, and I love orchestral music. And there was a period in time where I thought that was what I wanted to do for sure when I was a student. Um, but I think what that world for me lacks a little bit is uh, to be truly creative and mm -hmm. to build something. That's something that's highly attractive to me. And um, sometimes I feel like if you're playing with an orchestra or this kind of strict uh, interpretive role of music that's existed a long time, I don't necessarily feel like it's really creative work or as creative right. work as if you're just building something from scratch. So at some point I noticed that and that's what attracted me to taking a different route. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you, Nicoletta? Yeah, I think uh, from the point of view of pianists, um, that's quite different. Um, I think pianists uh, grow in a community that is maybe less communal actually than a percussionist and it's very like competitive and it's all about mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, solo careers through competitions and uh, learning 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 repertoire and so on um so well my blessing was that uh, i discovered uh, the contemporary repertoire and um maybe my blessing was actually that i didn't go into a specialized master program 
for contemporary repertoire. Therefore, everything I did was like by my own choice um, and uh, on my own terms, actually, mm -hmm. and often with festivals and courses outside of okay. the main university. Um, so during uh, this uh, mainly developed during uh, the two years of my master's and uh, during those years I also um, started seeing my fellows, uh, fellow students, uh, fellow pianists learning and uh, figuring out how they can be pianists and how to get gigs and um, I started also uh, working with other musicians and people were actually um, telling me, oh, you know, like, you're really good at working with other musicians. And so I started developing sort of the interest in chamber music. But then the problem was also to find the people that could uh, commit for a long time. Right. And that stay in the same geographical location for long enough to create something. Uh, so it was actually not until when we met with Chris that this could actually happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, for sure this interest of creating something is um, very strong for me as well. And uh, rather than, yeah, I like the fact that we create our own opportunities and we take yeah. complete responsibility on that. Yeah, um, I love all of that because um, I, I have a, my next question is a lot about the new music and, and also the lifestyle you're creating. I can't wait to, to get into that. But what you just said about that you both felt strongly about building something from scratch that was yours. Um, I think that's the foundation of what everyone's calling entrepreneurial skills and everything right now. It's kind of becoming a trend in music schools to start adding an entrepreneurial department. And from what I know from my own experience, not that I've I haven't built an ensemble, but I'm building a business and an, and a following and an audience, essentially. And what I know from that is that that takes just that burning desire to build something. And I don't think that everybody has that. So it's not when they say, like, here's here's a class you can take to teach you how to write a bio or do all these things. Like, sure, those are great skills and stuff, but I think at the root, at the core of it is what you just described. Like, that it wasn't going to be an option for you to not build something. What do you think of that? Yeah, well, for me, it's really, like I said, it was really natural for me. Like, mm -hmm. that's something I always, uh, you always wanted. Felt. I, it was I like think in it's your, just... Like you said, your percussion DNA. It was, like, always there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it comes down to people's own values. If mm -hmm. they, if they don't have what you described as a, a burning desire to do that, then of course they they shouldn't do that. There are lots of other right, exactly. other things out there, of course. So, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure whether it's necessary or not. I it's definitely helpful to really be engaged with what you're doing all the time. Right, because um, yeah. the, there's got to be a drive for all the work that you have to do because there's work outside of just preparing the music. There's a lot of, which you could talk, talk about later, how you, get, mm -hmm. how you get your residencies. But first, before we talk about that, I want to talk about, in our, in our previous conversation, you had mentioned, and I re really came through, that you felt like there was a real um, lifestyle and way of life to, to new music that doesn't necessarily get talked about a lot. And it looks like you guys are really living that. So I wanted to talk to you about um, what you mean by new music as like a lifestyle. That's pretty. Yeah, I think um, I think okay. I think the essence of it, I guess, is um, so. If if contemporary art in some ways is about asking questions and then giving something back as a response mm -hmm. and framing that uh, and then calling it art, if that's one aspect of contemporary art making then we're also taking those questions and bringing them into our own lives, asking what it takes to kind of live a life, like what 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 you need. And I think the artist residencies are just a fantastic platform to ask those questions. And that um, also, with those residencies as a platform, uh, you are taking new music to different places, and that's really important. Um, in a, in a city, sometimes you're in a situation, and of course this still happens to us as well, 
uh, you're in a situation where the audience is really just new music lovers and basically colleagues of yours, people that you could really work with and make more new music with, which is great. But um, when you're like right now, we're in the middle of nowhere in Latvia. When you play for people there, I mean, they're really people that would never, ever encounter this kind of music or what we're doing unless we organize an event. And I think that's really lovely. I don't know if that's um, necessarily something about living new music in life or something like this, but um, I'd say that's maybe how our specific lifestyle relates to new music. Okay. And just the, the fact that you are living without a permanent residence. I mean that's really com- that's really a commitment I would say to yeah yeah you know I mean a lot of people would be like what <laughs> you don't have an apartment in a city where you go back to like that I think that idea is super foreign to people don't you like do you get that question a lot yeah yeah definitely it's definitely hard I mean we meet new people often I mean we're always in a new place and the first thing we get asked is where we're from where we live. Yeah. I mean, so right off the bat, you have to address it. Um, and it's always a challenge for us, for sure. They, they, but, they, um, they keep asking, well, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean you don't have a place? Yeah. Like, right? So. Yeah, or, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and yeah. how do you feel about it at this point? How long has it been since you've had an apartment? So the last, I, it depends how we consider it. I mean, really, it's been since June uh 2017 mm-hmm. G- since june 2017 mm-hmm. um that we had a like a lease on an apartment that okay. is when our last lease ended and so it's it's been over a year did yeah. you have to get rid of all your stuff when you decided not to get another apartment yeah well yeah more or less Most yeah. of the stuff and then yeah we have some with us and yeah we didn't um, have much stuff to begin with. We didn't have much, yeah, that's more why we're reluctant. We just didn't have that much stuff to begin with. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were just out of school. Uh, we had an apartment in Brussels with furniture in it. We sold all the furniture. Like, there wasn't really, we happily accepted money for furniture. It was not a problem. And yeah, we just went on our way. It was okay. And right now we have like uh, two two backpacks of stuff and two instrument cases with some instruments in them. And yeah, that's what we take around everywhere. If it's on Ryanair. Uh, so. Ryanair, yes, I flew that <laughs> when I li- visited Europe. Um, as a percussionist, that must be hard to be minimalist because I've known a lot of percussion players. They have a lot of stuff. Yeah, I'm, I happily, happily don't have many pairs of mallets. Like, it's really, I don't know. I'm totally stoked about that. Yeah. Nothing bummed me out. Maybe I'm just super cheap, but nothing bummed me out <laughs> more in school than having to buy another pair of mallets just because some situation arose where somehow the world decided you needed this super, super specific <laughs> pair of mallets or something. And I was really always bummed out about that. And at some point, I just made a commitment to never buy mallets again. And I realized that everything was fine. <laughs> you know? And so now I just really use, I bring, I bring as few mallets as possible where I can still more or less play any instrument, mm-hmm. but like, I'm not bringing like Tam Tam beaters with me if any percussionists are li- listening, like it's ridiculous. <laughs> I have a pair, I have a four vibraphone mallets, four hard plastic mallets, four hard rubber mallets, a pair of drumsticks and a pair of brushes. That's what I have. Yeah. That's great. I mean, that's about as little as I think I can I can bear so yeah so in the in the broader sense of the term do you guys consider yourself like that you're living a minimalist lifestyle like write a magazine about it you know (laughs) I mean it's like a real movement it's a movement here you don't believe so that you are living that or no I wouldn't say so because I think that traveling to a new place each month is there's not really much minimalist about that that's right. if it's about um uh living life with only like kind of essential things i guess like i don't really know much about uh this movement i guess but um travel is doesn't strike me as something that's like essential like you can live your whole life and never travel so uh there's something really not minimalist about doing that i think yeah, that's but true. we don't have many things uh, uh, we don't have many things, and we really don't like purchasing things. I mean, yeah, I don't I think, think we're very materialistic, but yeah. 
Right. And I think that's, I mean, you're right. When people get into the environmental, all of that, that's a little different. But I think there's a big movement of people that just feel like, oh, I'm tired of stuff. I'm tired of bringing more stuff in my house and then in a year wanting to get rid of it. Like it's just this like cycle. So it seems like that your lifestyle has freed you up from that burden so that you can focus on your art, which I think is incredible. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, for sure. So tell me more about the um, residencies, how you go about um, getting invited to do things and, you know, the whole nine yards, how, how far in advance you get them yeah. and all that. Yeah. Okay. So um, just to kind of try to define what the residencies are, uh, because uh, the so somebody is artist in residence, some kind of institution um, that they were like appointed to some position or like a curator has found them or something. Uh, that's a way you use the word, but it is uh, that's not really what we mean when we say artist residencies. Okay. We're mainly just talking about these opportunities that artists can apply for. Um, of course, those people are like artists in residence, but like um, it's it's not really the same thing as exactly what we're talking about. So there are a lot of institutions out there that host artists each month, each year through an application process or an open call, something like this. Mm -hmm. um, and people apply with project proposals and CVs, like the th things you normally apply to stuff with. Um, and then they select artists and those artists can come there for a certain amount of time and work on their project. And all of them are on completely different terms. They're for different durations. Some of them are uh, don't have any cost some of them have a cost and then others pay the artist some kind of stipend. So there are just three different like financial situations from them and they exist in all sorts of locations, rural, rural places, urban places, uh, anything you can think of. There are all sorts of durations as well. Most of them that we've been doing are about a month, but there are plenty we've done that are two weeks. Um, and then there are plenty that are longer. We did one that was nine weeks. Um, we'll be doing one that's six months. There are even some that are like a year long. Uh, and they take all sorts of different kinds of disciplines as well. So there's ones that are uh, strictly geared towards musicians, but then there's many that are for every discipline, and then there's some that are like just for textile artists or just for painters. So, um, yeah. And so to find these institutions, uh, thankfully, there's these fantastic organizations that have created basically databases of the residencies. And so those are transartist.org. Uh, resartists.org uh, and there's also something called Alliance of Artist Communities that that one is based out of uh, the United States okay. and um, yeah they each host like uh, kind of a page e uh, for each residency and there are really like probably thousands of them we've been through hundreds and hundreds of them and they're in they're all over the world really and anywhere you can think of um, yeah so we start by just kind of scouring these databases for all the different residency opportunities and we make a big document somewhere with like all the ones that we might want to apply for. Um, and we just make a calendar where all the deadlines are there. Some of them are on like rolling deadlines so you can just apply whenever you want. And we just try to fit everything together. We also keep this thing uh, that I really love called the anti-resume which is uh, an Excel spreadsheet where we keep track of everything that we apply to and whether or not we got it. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can kind of see your batting average for applications. And I think it's lovely because like right now we're kind of 50-50, which is great because you just know you have to apply to twice as much stuff right. as you want to have. And even if you're like one in four, one in 20, it doesn't matter. You just know how much work it takes to get an opportunity. And I think it's really easy to help people persevere if they just know how much work something is going to take instead of just like getting a bunch of rejection letters and, and not knowing what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you need, if your residencies are, are longer and you're trying to like fill out a whole year, maybe you just need like 10 or 12 of them. So you just have to do like maybe 30 applications. I mean, it's not, it's like an attainable thing, I think, uh, if we think about it in those terms. So I, I really like thinking about it that way. Um, yeah, there's got to be a certain amount of organization is what you're saying. For sure. And like, in, you know, doing the math, like, okay, this is, this is our rate of being accepted. So we know what to, to expect going in yeah. and how many, yeah, because you need, uh, 
as, a, as people who don't have a residence, there is no stability of, I can just go home if nothing pans out. Like you, you've put yourself well, in this Well, there's always, there's always somebody. There's like mom and dad, a friend in this <laughs> city, whatever, you yeah. know, like, it's not like we're, we're just like yeah. all alone. You but know? also That's good. once we see, okay, we have this week in two months that we don't know where you're going to be. You can always start emailing the presenters and organize a tour or organize a oh. project. Composer, to or fill in, to fill in in between yeah. residencies. You exactly. Can a tour. That's yeah. Smart. So we normally think of like an anchor opportunity, something that really makes it worthwhile to go where you're going. Yes. And then we just try to build off of that. Um, yeah, yeah tell the story the about, t you got to tell them the story about, was it Iceland that this happened? Sure. Because yeah, yeah. I, I was asking you about like the financial aspect of, of you mentioned that there were three different types. Sometimes you get paid, sometimes you don't have to pay to be there, and sometimes you have to pay, pay to be there. And that was, I was like, huh, so how do you get money when you're there? And so, and then you brought up the Iceland trip. So why don't you tell sure. us about that? Yeah, so as far as the paid residencies, like ones you pay for, mm -hmm. are concerned, um, I think it's really important to note that almost never, hopefully, are they more expensive than rent would be in that region. Okay. Uh, you are always saving money. So, like, in the end, the life we're living, including the price of travel, it's always cheaper than it would be to live in a city. Mm. So we just don't need to accrue as much money to fund it. It's just, okay. I think in this way, it's kind of easier. And just our, just living our life is an artistic project. Mm -hmm. It's not like when we're sitting at home, like every moment is kind of grantable in a way. So we can always apply to a grant to help fund the residencies. So Iceland, which is an expensive place to live. Um, the residency there was quite pricey as far as residencies go. Um, do you remember what it was? Yeah, like probably 800 euros. Per month? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we applied to uh, some grants um, for, from the Nordic Council. The Nordic Council has a lot of funding opportunities for things that happen in the Nordic countries. Mm -hmm. And we got that grant. But... To apply for that grant, you need to include three uh, Nordic countries in your proposal. So just the idea of applying to the grant for the residency we already had that we couldn't afford uh, pushed us to make a project that included more Nordic countries. Okay. So as soon as we were applying to this grant, we contacted a lot of people and applied to more residencies in the Nordic countries. And we built a project around the Nordic countries that could be eligible for this funding from the grant. And then we got the grant. And then once you get the grant, it's sometimes it's even easier to get more opportunities related to the project. So if we had said, oh, this is unaffordable, I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would have been maybe like 10 months of projects, really, that wouldn't have happened, I think. Wow. So it's really important to... Uh, I think, think really long term in terms of how the cost of an opportunity, opportunity cost, you know? Mm. Um, yeah. So we weren't thinking about just this one residency. We were thinking about a whole Nordic project and that really benefited us in that case. Plus every residency is also a community and there are organizers and they're very supportive and often try to help you organize. And uh, often events... Even if they are for free, they you, you can receive donations, and uh, it's always very satisfying. And anyway, our philosophy is really like long term, but also just do it, and then you make it work. Mm -hmm. Because you gotta figure out one of the many ways that it's gonna happen. Yeah. yeah, like you don't know what the next step is until you take the first step. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. It sounds exciting. You guys feel like you're living, it's exciting what you're doing? Yeah. We're super happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're really, really excited about what we do. Yeah. It seems amazing. I'm, I'm, I was so looking forward to talking to you guys about this. I'm sort of like a travel, uh, I'm really interested in travel. I'd love to do more of it. And you guys, it's just built in to what you do, which I 
I think is incredible. So one of the yeah. thing one of the things we talked about um, on our previous conversation, I'd like to bring up again is um, the concept of stability, like in your career and your life. I think that's really sold to us. Just it, it might be from the older generations. I know for my parents, it certainly was and likely teachers too, especially teachers who had those stable careers, stable, you know, the ones that they got into an orchestra and they played there for 40 years kind of deal, you know, and those were who the, the teachers who I was surrounded by because I went that orchestra route. And, um, and of course it was, it just seemed like part of the dream, maybe because it was so instilled in me that that was how, that was what you were supposed to strive for. And, now that I'm a grown up and I and I see that there's so much more to life than just landing yourself a job so you can be so you can feel like you're stable, like there's so much more to it. And I think you guys are living a living example of that. And I want to know, did you ever start out with that mentality or were you free from it or did you have to break from it? Yeah, I think um I think it's really important to kind of ask what that means, stability. Mm -hmm. um, I think people people want what they want for like completely different reasons, and sometimes they don't really know what they want. Um, and that stability is like a big, big part of that question. Uh, like why somebody wants this tenured position, for example. But um, and I think there are people that really do want that for the right reasons and they're extremely happy for that whole tenure and then there are other people that aren't and it's really important to self-reflect on one's own values and decide whether that might be for them or if they should try to do something else as far as kind of inheriting that perspective uh, from older generations mm -hmm. um, if I were living in the example of my father and older siblings and stuff definitely they took more of those paths for sure um, I'm not sure. I'm sure that's probably what they wanted uh, for me. I'm not super sure about it, though. It wasn't. Um, yeah, I think society definitely imposes um, a precedent as far as living that kind of stable life goes. Yeah. Um, yeah. For us, I think it's just about questioning our values, like what really what we really value in life and then trying to choose to do things that are in line with those values. Yeah, if, uh, if we had any uh, idea about stability at, at some point, it was about geographical stability, in fact, because mm -hmm. when we were living uh, separated, um, we thought that finding one special spot for the duo, one city, uh, one place would really like solve problems or and make it really uh, easy for us to develop ideas and so on. But then we realized that that's not really a solution. And uh, we find it so uh, much more uh, interesting and useful to recodify all of our uh, values and ideas about the duo every time we are moving and trying to repropose our music to the different communities and see if it actually uh, is valuable as much as we think. So maybe that's an idea of stability we had to break from. Okay, yeah. So uh, as you guys worked, you, you became, you came together and then you started, you started your duo. Was this something you talked about or was it something that just became understood as you, as you started to plan the model of the duo? Yeah. Um, we didn't plan to be traveling continually. We were always traveling a lot because of the long distance nature of the duo. Mm -hmm. And then there came a point where we had like six months of travel booked and then like a couple month break and then like another six months of travel booked or something like this. And we just thought, hey, if we, if we bridge that gap of two months with just something else, um, then we don't have to rent a place. We don't have to spend all that yeah. money on rent the whole time or figure out who to sublet it to and it's just like a whole lot of responsibility that isn't worth it stress. isn't worth it it isn't worth the stress yeah. if you're just not going to be there at all and so we we were like of course we're not going to rent mm -hmm. the place we just got to figure out how to get off the lease or whatever uh and so we did that and then 
as we were traveling, we were we were still like applying for stuff and doing all the same stuff we normally were. And so it became a really natural transition just to be like, okay, so this is what we do now. <laughs> um, yeah. And honestly, it's, I, I think for us, it's easier. I, I think it's really, it, there are many ways that our lives are really stable, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think our routine kind of changes every time we go to a new location, but there are lots of ways that are, we know what we're going to be doing in two years. I mean, we know where we'll be. That's, yeah. that's stability in a certain way. Yeah, I guess. it yeah, sure is. Thinking yeah. about these like choices of either staying or having an apartment or going and so on, it just, at some point it seemed to us that so many people are not actually choosing their lifestyle, their like stability. It's not actually an active choice mm-hmm. and that's probably the worst thing. Oh, yeah. No, I agree. I mean, I I spent time in a city thinking that who knows if I'll be here next year or the year after, depending on auditions and stuff. So you can totally feel unstable even if you have an apartment. So I think I think it's just about priorities. And you guys clearly have priorities for your career that don't include living in one city. And so you just acted on that and made it happen. So I, I just think it's it's really great to, to get a view into how you're navigating that and, and creating a completely different way of doing it. I love, I really love it. So neat. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about the obvious elephant in the room, which is always student loan debt, because I know Nicoletta, you probably, it's a different story in Europe with Mm -hmm. how much college costs. And Chris, you went to school in the US. Um, So how do you feel about, or how's that going? I'll just say that, how's that going (laughs) with with the income you have and and just what you have to do with loans, paying them back and stuff like that? Sure, so I have student loan debt. Uh, I don't, I hope nobody thinks that um, that is stopping them from doing anything. it is, it's like a stressful thing to think about as you're graduating and stuff, like, of course. Um, but, yeah, all I'll say is that um, if if you don't know about the income-driven repayment programs, it's fantastic because it bases the payment on a percentage of your income. Mm-hmm. So it's not really possible for it to be unaffordable for you. It can't exceed what you are making. And it's 10% normally, I think 10 to 12% of your yearly income. Um, yeah, so it's kind of like paying taxes. Right. Uh, so it's really super reasonable. Um, it's just like another monthly expense, and that's what I'm doing. So, yeah, I don't think it's... Um, yeah, I try not to spend uh, a single extra thought on them. Like, uh, don't don't let it stress you out, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, in this way, it's like a really fantastic thing the government is doing. And those uh, income-driven repayment plans, they all have a loan forgiveness situation so that if you make 25, 20, 25 years of on-time payments and you do all the paperwork every year and you do it all right, they're supposed to forgive your loans uh, at, at the end of that time period. Uh, you have to declare the uh, forgiveness as taxable income on that year. So you have to kind of be ready for a pretty heavy mm. taxation at some point. But you, you know, you plan ahead for that, I think. And it's okay. Um, yeah. And you'll still be paying something. Yeah. Right. Of course, and but, yeah, yeah, just getting educated about what's possible and then not stressing. I think that's definitely definitely a good message to say because I think it stops a lot of people like oh my god I'm burdened by these by these debts and the, and it's just a fact of life honestly but in hindsight and I'd love to hear Nicoletta's point of view too I- as far as Europe goes and I'm not even sure exactly if Americans can or anyone from another country if you if you're allowed to go to university in Europe and how that payment would work but um in hindsight, do you guys have any uh, have any opinions about, I mean, now that you know all the stuff that's out there residency-wise and everything, like maybe you guys have another opinion about what there is to do besides continuing, say, like getting three degrees in music or something. Because I know a lot of people go on 
I've met tons of people who go on to get a doctorate and maybe that's just because they they don't know what they want. And so they just keep going. It's definitely the path of least resistance to continue your education once you're started. Like I can say that from personal experience that I definitely, when I was leaving my master's, the culture in that specific program was to keep studying there as long as possible, Mm. to keep studying there until you have a job basically and you can leave. Like I think that was the general situation. And um, I didn't like that personally because it was a very expensive school too. Um, But so I opted to leave it. I, after the master's, like I opted to just graduate and, and continue on. But we were also already starting with the duo like pretty seriously. So I knew at least artistically I would be doing something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in hindsight, I would say that if you could study, yeah, just like this is a exclusively American problem of this crazy high tuition. Nobody else is really dealing with this. Just study somewhere else. I mean, I'm not saying I I really, really loved my education, like every second of it. I had fantastic teachers and I'm endlessly grateful to them. Like I can't overstate how grateful I am for having fantastic instructors and I wouldn't give up my education for anything. Mm -hmm. Um, But like there's also really good schools everywhere. But and you can you can definitely study in Europe if you're American. That is. Yeah, of course. And it's. If it's not free, it's going to be so much cheaper, like laughably cheaper. Really? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, sure. Like a program. I mean, I would avoid the UK, but the rest of Europe is really accessible. Yeah, but let's let's be let's be truthful about this. Nico studied in the UK, which he's considering expensive, and a, a semester of tuition was like three thousand uh, pounds. Oh my gosh, are you serious? Uh, no, three, seven thousand for the year. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that's, uh, it's not the same so level. The, like, so yes, semester, that's money, but you don't have to go into debt yeah. to do that. You could right. feasibly work and pay that amount of money. Right. You know, so and that's, study. That's like, 6,000 pounds a year. That, what is that, like $12,000 about? Uh, it's more in dollars. I don't know if it's double, It's but yeah. Yeah, plus scholarships that right. help you with that. Yeah. Yeah, that's and then uh, that's a good piece. And of the UK is much uh, more expensive for school than like continental Europe. So, yeah, definitely consider it. Plus, I mean, there are so many fantastic things about living in another country, even for a short period of time. Like, mm-hmm. it's really going to change your perception of the world. I think like it's a great, it's a great thing to consider for sure, for yeah. sure. Yeah. So, like, continuing on the topic of staying in school, I think it's widely recognized that it's mostly because we are somehow scared of the real world Mm -hmm. because school does not really prepare us to face the real world and uh, many of us do not know what it is about to be a musician in the real world. But the truth is that what you will be doing in school in the uh, how many four extra years of doctoral studies or whatever it's probably not something that you wouldn't be able to do even if you were outside of school without having to pay the fees. And like, for example, I see the percussionists and they stay in school also because they have all this infrastructure mm-hmm. in place for them. But the truth is that after these extra four years or whatever, you still have to deal with that. Yeah. And it's just insane not to try to face that situation. Right. As you, soon spend, as possible. you spend like... Thirty thousand dollars a year, so you can have all the percussion equipment available to you. But maybe with yeah. that money, you could just buy the equipment yourself. Yeah, yeah for <laughs> right? sure. And taking some yeah. lessons, right? I know it's like you have to just think outside the box a little bit. Honestly, <laughs> I I'm just thinking about oh, going to Europe and living there for a year. I I completely agree with you. How much how valuable that would be. I mean, not only do you get to immerse yourself in a different culture, but possibly become fluent in another language. And mm. save money on top of it and see the world like it's definitely got to be in in the realm of consideration for people i mean yeah I, th- I think they don't know how accessible an option it is yeah yeah like i think th- the main um the main message about the artist residencies is that uh that that they should be seen as attainable and affordable 
because they really are. It's really within reach of anybody who's a practicing artist to to save, to pay less on the residency than they would in rent, and to to apply and to get into some of them. It's definitely attainable. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm going to link those, the things that you had mentioned in, in the show notes. So if people are listening and they're like, oh, I want to check this out, um, they can look at those databases. And I love that you mentioned too, that cer certainly there are residencies just for musicians. And then there are ones that musicians can apply to that aren't just for musicians, like artists and dancers and stuff, and musicians are still invited. So that's, that broadens the um, possibilities. If, and if you're just going out looking for musician ones, you're probably missing out on a whole bunch of other ones that are available to Definitely. you too. So that's a good piece of information to have. This is such a cool life. I'm like so inspired. I want to follow you guys around and watch what you're doing now. I'm going <laughs> to Instagram stalk you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to check out their Instagram feed. They have beautiful photos of all the places that they are um, in. And I, I tagged you guys in my stories today, but I'll, I'll do it again for sure when the, when the episode comes out. Um, so what are you, who's inspiring you in the new music world right now? Nico? <laughs> <laughs> who's inspiring us? We're, we're always like trying to keep up with things, but there's so much music yeah. around. Everybody's inspiring us. Let's say that. <laughs> there's, yeah. I mean. Yeah. It's like um, countless friends and colleagues just doing awesome things. The world of it is is enormous. It's it's so much bigger than I had thought. You know, when I was when I was kind of holed up in my little orchestra world, I would just find out about new music from based on oh, this is on the first half of the concert. Honestly, <laughs> you know. And then when I started this podcast, I'm like, this is endless. There's so many cool things going on. So. Um, I just love it. Are you guys going to be back in the U.S. on a tour anytime soon? On a tour, no. We have a residency in February in Key West, and that's the next time we'll be in the States. And then we won't be back there for a while, I think. Mm -hmm. But Have you yeah. been to Key West before? No. It's fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> cool. It's really yeah. great. So where's the? what's the residency about in Key West? Um, Studios of Key West, so it's one of the main like, arts uh, organizations in the area, I think. Main arts organizations in Key West? Yeah. It's a really cute little community there. I think you're going <laughs> to really like it. It's very unique. It's very party-centric, but also just it's a unique um, vibe there. It's cool. You'll yeah. like it. Cool. Awesome. So do you have anything else you'd like to promote coming up that people could check you out on perhaps online or, or your next thing that you have coming up in Europe? If you're in Latvia <laughs> <laughs> on, oh, on Friday. Friday, we're performing in Daugav Pils at the Rothko Art Center, if you happen to be there. But uh, also, yeah, just check out our videos, I'd say. Just yeah. um on our website or on YouTube or on Facebook. Uh, we make music videos of all of the pieces we play. And yeah, it's really, it's one of the joys of what we do. Like we really just love making those. Uh, yeah. Fabulous. I love it. Thank you guys so much for being on the show. This is just so great finding out all about your amazing career. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Thanks for joining me today. If you want to find out more about Passepartout Duo and their work or check out some of the artist residency opportunities for yourself that were mentioned in the show, check out the links in the show notes. Feel free to share this episode and all Crushing Classical episodes with friends. I really appreciate you spreading the word. Don't forget to join the conversation on Facebook and Instagram where I start conversations on relevant topics about building a career you love in classical music. I look forward to meeting you there. Thanks again for joining me today and I'll see you next time.